it's to see beforehand. When something happens, it's already been decreed. And the funny thing is that God moves in history even though he himself does not change. I don't understand it. I say these things, but I don't understand them. The God moves because he's always in everything. He's in every atom. In the farthest universe, he's omnipresent, and he, he moves in history. And yet, he himself, the decree never changes. The decree is singular and eternal. So even though uh, God is with us, moving with us, still he is not changing. It's an eternal God who moves. And I don't understand what that means. I read it somewhere, but I'll say it. But the, another thing about the decrees of God is that sometimes they, they're described as singular and sometimes plural. And that's because that's, the idea is the same. In other words, the decrees of God are his eternal purpose, not eternal purposes. So he has one eternal fixed decree. This is all beyond us. You know, we're, we're just so small. The idea that God has eternal, in eternity, has the whole plan is just to me amazing. It's like, you know, I'm a finite creature and I'm trying to understand an infinite creature. I'm limited and he's not limited. I saw these pictures. I, I used that illustration a few weeks ago. The closest star to us is six light years away. That's our closest neighbor as a star. That's 26 trillion miles. Who even knows what a million miles looks like? 26 trillion miles. That's the closest. And that is, you know, means the galaxy is thousands of light years wide and there are thousands of galaxies. It's big. The whole story is big. And it could be, too, that this is not all there is to God, that this may be just a, a partial revelation of his power. We may have more. It's not told to us that this is a total revelation of his power. He may be just revealing himself in, uh, in part. Anyway, these are the decrees of God. And the reason we study it Again, it's because it, the theology is all a fabric. It's all tied together and sewn together. But it's not sewn together the way we think it is. That's the, the funny thing. We have a system, but it's also not a system. It's not a system because we're dealing with God himself. And it's not a system because it doesn't obey our, our reasoning powers often. Creation. Who thought of that? predestination and free will. How do you put them together? Who thought of that? There, the, the theology doesn't hang together. Even Paul remarks justification of a wicked man. You are telling a wicked man that he's righteous. How could it be? You know, it's beyond, it just doesn't hang together the way we think it should. And I'd advise you to keep studying the Bible and do your best to get it to hang to, for your sake of your people, David Dean, for the sake of your congregation and your daughter, you know, teach them the Bible. The Bible is the Bible, is the Bible. Anyway, what we're studying here is uh, some, hopefully some help to understanding the Bible. And hopefully, you know, th there was a reformation and that's what, what I'm trying to get at, because I've never seen anyone teach a course on the Reformation. The Reformation changed everything. That one word, justification by faith. You see, Luther was troubled. Was con he, he was working hard. He was a German. And he had no peace. But it's not just Luther. That's the whole of Europe or you might even say the whole of humanity, but especially 
in Catholic Europe. The Catholic Church said, you can't get to God except through the sacraments. And we're blocking the sacraments. You've got to pay more. You have to do more work, more penance. you got to have indulgences. When a, when a coin in the coffer clings, clinks, rings, rings another and soul from, from purgatory springs. springs. Right. It's in Germany. <laughs> right. So the money is pressure. It's pressure on the common man. How do you get to heaven? And the, then the, so the Catholic Church now has this common, simple people, and he tell, they tell them, you want to go to heaven, right? You want, you want to be baptized. Baptism will get you to heaven. Yeah, but you can't take the Lord's Supper because you've been banned. It's going to cost to take the Lord's Supper this week or this month. And an explosive situation builds up. But you can see it in Luther himself. You don't have to look that far. Just look at Luther. And you realize that the man is suffering under the lack of grace, the lack of the message of God's grace. And then he discovers this one word, a way through justification. God declares me righteous. And now everything changes. Bible changes. Oh my goodness, the church has not been teaching us the Bible. And God is now a loving God whom we know. And predestination. Where did I get this knowledge but from God himself? So the church changes. And Europe explodes. The there's a huge war in Germany, there's war in Holland and England and, and America. What do you think happens in America? We have a revolution. There's war in America too. Every place is war, but it's related in some way to the Protestant church. What does the American Revolution have to do with Martin Luther? Good idea, good question. I'll tell you because I know something about it. I read Kevin Phillips' book called The Cousins Wars. That, that book claims that all the Anglo wars in modern history are the same war. The three major wars are the English Civil War, the American Revolution, and the American Civil War. And yes, sir, Phillips, I think. Single L, Kevin. His first name is Kevin. I have it at home, I can see it. So it's called the Cousins War. And what it is, is that England was divided east and west. In the east were the Puritans, in the west were the Anglicans. And under Charles I, they went to war. And there comes a great hero of history, one of my greatest heroes, Oliver Cromwell. He's a simple, common man. He's, he's peaceful and peace-loving. And God turns him into a warrior. I mean, a warrior warrior. The field of battle warrior. Blood and swords and guns. And so, you know, Cromwell ends up going to war against the king of England. And winning. And he goes to war against Ireland and wins. I think that it's true that Cromwell never lost a battle in, on the battlefield. Anyway, Cromwell establishes Parliament, and he establishes some kind of Puritan tolerance or independent tolerance. Doesn't last very long, but during this period, the pilgrims come to America. Puritans are kicked out of England. <coughs> And they come and found Harvard. 1620, they come to Plymouth Colony. And 1636, they found Harvard. Mm. So, uh, so what is, what are you saying now? What does Martin Luther have to do with what? The American Revolution. Yeah. Well, in the American Revolution is still this pressure 
the, the English had tried to force a prayer book on the Scots, the Book of Common Prayer. And they went, the English went and marched on Scotland, 1639, the Battle of Berwick. And the Scots met them at the border. It's a border town. The howling Scottish Covenanters, us Presbyterians. And the Scots said to the English, we, regarding Charles I, we honor you as our secular king. But if you intend to enter Scotland to force that prayer book on us, we'll stop you here. And they did. They took all the English positions and a rare, rare act of mercy in war. They didn't kill anyone or almost no, I don't think they killed anyone. And they told the English army, go back home and don't try it again. So there is established there with the Scots the principle of religious liberty. Hmm. You see, they're telling the king of England, when it comes to the church, you're nothing. You're a, you, we honor you as a secular king. Hmm. But don't push any further because we'll stop you. We're not going to, and this is America. That, now, when America is founded, the Presbyterians are, are still here. They remember what happened in England. And they say, we're not, you know, if, if we let the English rule, we're, we're going to lose our religious liberty again. And there's the whole taxation thing, blah, blah. I don't know the whole story. I know nothing. I just read a little bit. So, in any case, what this has to do with Martin Luther is that the principle of Protestantism wants to succeed. Or if you call it, want to call it a Presbyterian principle. But Calvin is in there too, because Calvin is the author of Presbyterianism. And they call the American Revolution the Presbyterian War. And George III in England said, I blame this whole American Revolution on one Presbyterian pastor, John Witherspoon. Mm. So they located <coughs> the, the center of interest and they, they said, this is a Presbyterian War. And we're fighting Presbyterians again. But it was the same, you see, as in England, the Cousins Wars. Religious liberty, was that what that? Well, yeah, that's common? part of it. Yeah, that's our constitution, Re religious liberty, yeah. That's part of it, yes. The liberty to, to have, you know, uh, it's, I think the American... Constitution was original. My friend John Betancourt says that we had a confession of the of triune God somewhere in the Constitution. But yeah, I think that's it. I mean, the you, you have. Um, I, I think what you have in America, that's why it's called the Cousins Wars, is the recollection. See the. The English Civil War was 16, whatever, 40 to 1660. So now the American Revolution is 1776. It's 100 years later. But the parties are the same. It's still Anglican against Puritan. The Puritans in Connecticut, in Massachusetts, and they're still fighting that English war, which is we don't want these people here. We want to kick them out. Okay? Is that, and that's where Luther is. Luther is the beginning of it all. But Luther, you see, that what I'm trying to get across is that Luther changes everything. The church changes, which means the society changes. He, and Calvin upsets the whole thing. He calls the Catholic Church frauds, ludicrous, he says. It's, it's crazy that these people call themselves 
priests, uh, he says, the priest in the Old Testament could teach. These people don't know anything. He said, they've never read a book. They're, they're not qualified to be priests. They, all they have is they call the benefices. They had land that produced money for them and they had a political appointment so rich children could become bishops and uh, you could live a, a, a comfortable life as, as a monk, pastor, priest. But Calvin said it's all a fraud because you'd expect that they would know some doctrine at least. And they don't. They don't know anything. So he calls them dumb dogs. He said, these dumb dogs with their miters and their caps, they, they walk about like they're somebody important, but they, they don't have any resemblance to the apostles who could teach. And so the chief then office of the church becomes the teaching office. It's through teaching that uh, the ministry is fulfilled. And he takes that from the Old Testament that the high priest in the Old Testament could teach, Calvin quotes. Mm. And um, uh, then th there come the, the changes of the sacraments. The sacraments are not so important for the Catholics. You can't be saved without the sacraments. The, the Protestants go, no, you can be saved without them. Abraham was saved with, without circumcision. So anyway, let's go on. Shall we move on? Sure. Okay. Of the church, which is the what we're supposed to study today. And so let's go to it. Let's uh, discuss some of this. Now, the, the church... Oh, gosh, it was so unusual to read Calvin on this. You know, reading Calvin, you're actually going back to the Middle Ages and listening to a man who has experience in the Middle Ages. And he's, uh, they're, they're changing the world with the change of the church. The, the church controls everything, the holidays and the, the, whole, the whole world of customs in the church. And the Protestants start changing it. Now, this is the description of the church, and I want to. I'm sorry, I'm, uh, I'm going to surprise you. I want to deal with this just one word: visible and invisible. You see it here in yellow: invisible, in visible, visible. Sometimes less visible. I want to discuss what this means. Uh, this word, a visible church, or an invisible church. So I'll just read this for background. The Catholic or universal church, which is invisible, consists of the whole number of the elect that have been, are, or shall be gathered into one under Christ, the head thereof, and, and is the spouse, the body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. And it says the visible church, which is also Catholic or universal. So it's quite complicated <clears throat> what is going on here with this vi visible and invisible. And the Catholic or visible church hath been given the ministry. Now this is good. Oracles and ordinances. The church in the Protestant view has maybe two great marks. It has to have preaching and it has to have sacraments and to have sacraments you have to have discipline so Protestant, Protestant churches at least under Calvin they excommunicate people if they're living dirty lives in China Robert L. Nevius a Presbyterian missionary to China had 20% of his congregations excommunicated at any given time. That's to keep, the purpose of discipline, at least in the mind of some, is to keep the sacraments pure. You don't want unbelievers taking the sacraments and pretending to be Christians when they don't really have a Christian uh, doctrine or life. So, 
um, what is going on here? One thing that's going on is that in the time of Augustine, you have children. Now, children have to be baptized. And once you're baptized in the Catholic Church, you're regenerated. So it's automatic. It's magic. Do we get the word? Probably hocus pocus from hocus corpus matum. Hocus. It's, it's magic. You, you take the sacrament and you automatically are a Christian. You're born again. Not through faith. You're, you're an infant. Not through anything. It's just the power and the magic of the Catholic Church. So, what happens if you're not baptized? Well, then you're going to hell. Okay, now you have children. They come from Christian homes, and they're born. And before they can get them to the priest for baptism, they die. What happens to them? So, the, the, uh, Augustine said, well, there's an invisible church. The children are in an invisible church, a church where they've never obeyed, they've never learned, they've never been baptized, they never got anything, but God is kind to them. Now, Westminster Confession is not so far from wrong. Uh, Westminster Confession says um, the uh, elect infants dying in infancy are regenerated and saved. So we have a faith that the children of believers are likely saved. The, the blessing, you see, the Bible doesn't address the children. It addresses the parents. It tells the parents, if you keep faith, your children will be in the covenant and saved. So you can be assured that if your infant son or daughter dies but you have faith God will honor that faith in the care for your child but still it's a mystery because it's invisible we can't see it we cannot see the election of an infant okay so we have a church which is invisible now by the way this is a good illustration too of a problem with theology I'm going to review an article by John Murray and the article says this term is not valid it shouldn't be used in other words Murray is saying the confession is wrong and I'm in agreement with Murray I love him but it means that the, oh, the sole rule of faith is the Bible not the confession and in this case the confession is probably wrong there is no such thing as an invisible church. Nobody ever attended an invisible church. You can't be kicked out of an invisible church. You cannot have discipline in an invisible church. You can't take the sacraments in an invisible church. You can't get the word of God preached to you in an invisible church. So Murray says that this term is, uh, has liabilities. It, shouldn't, it should, probably shouldn't be used at all. We should not really speak at all about the, a visible or invisible church. In the New Testament, most of the time when it talks about the church, it's talking about the visible church. The ch and, and Murray says we should change that to just call it the church, because that's what the New Testament calls it. You, no place do you hear the church addressed as visible or invisible. It's the church, and the church is um, uh, entrusted with uh, this, this new form from the Reformation of, of preaching and a clean Lord's table, where you keep people away from the Lord's table who are openly sinful. Hodge mentions that, how... The Roman Catholic sacramental system, you see, blesses the mafia. You get the Lord's Supper, they even call. The chief mafioso is called Godfather. So what does that mean? 
It means that the Catholic Church has such faith in the magic of baptism that even if you're a bandit, a criminal, you're still in the church because you've touched the sacraments. So we should be aware of that. That's not a Protestant view. That's one of the great differences between Protestant and Catholic, and that is Protestants believe you should live a holy life, whereas the Catholics believe you should be baptized, and we don't buy that. I love, you gotta read Calvin on this. Calvin just smacks them around mercilessly to call them frauds, pseudo, pseudo religion. He, he says that Catholic Church is apostate. I was surprised at how strong his language was for the Catholic Church, but it's there. Okay, so what I wanna study and continue to study is what this term visible or invisible means, and I wanna review Murray's article, and I wanna remind you what the purpose of this is, and that is that the confession could be wrong. And there's another place where it's probably wrong. And uh, it's here in paragraph six. You see this Roman numeral six? So you, you see what I'm pointing at? There is no other head of the church but the Lord Jesus Christ, nor can the Pope of Rome in any sense be head thereof, but is that Antichrist, that man of sin, and son of perdition, and exalteth himself in the church against Christ and all that is called God. The Orthodox Presbyterian Church changed this to what is above it. There is no other head of the church but the Lord Jesus Christ, nor can the Pope of Rome be head thereof. See, they took out all those curses of the Pope, the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition. I got into trouble once like this at the Harvard Club because I knew this stuff. And the president of the Harvard Club came to me and he said to me, have you been saying bad things about Catholics? And I said, you mean like the Pope is the beast 666, the Antichrist? He said, yeah, things like that. I said, no, I didn't say them. <laughs> <laughs> He said, oh, okay. <laughs> but there it is in the Westminster Confession. In the actual confession of 1646, the Pope is the beast, 666. He's the Antichrist. And the, the church today took it out. And they felt that it was not biblical. That really the Bible speaks of many Antichrists and the Pope is just one of them. And... Um, but my man, you get, gosh, you have to read Calvin because he has no use for the popes at all. He thinks that they're all frauds. So the, this is, you know, and uh, you should go to church. Calvin says you, you should be a Christian. You should go to a regular church. You should hear the Bible preached and you should take the sacraments and to ignore that you're really a hypocrite you can't call yourself a Christian if you don't have a communion of the saints so you really should have a, a normal Christian life and uh, but he doesn't count uh, Romanism as normal he considers it to be a fraud I'm sorry to say it but there it is so the revision seems to focus on the, the key principle, which is the fact that there is no other head of the church but Christ. Yes. In the original, it puts the Pope as diametrically opposed to Christ. Yes. Well, that's the 16th century, 17th century. This was written in 1646, so maybe the conflict with Rome was more present and real. It was the time of the Spanish Armada and Queen Elizabeth in, in England had been excommunicated by the Pope, so there was the conflict was real. It created an eternal trouble between England and Ireland, because um, I forget when Queen Elizabeth was the first, time, fifteen something, but she she was excommunicated, and. Um, 
that made Ireland a, a hostile enemy on the west coast of England because Ireland was Catholic. So it created a war and then Ireland became allied with the Spanish because they were Catholic and they sent the Armada to conquer England but God stopped them with a hurricane. Anyway, there's a, a question that I intend to pursue now. I, I believe that all good teaching should have just one point, and that is we're going to discuss it visible and invisible now for a long time. <laughs> so I hope you get the point. Um, now, we, we should have a communion of the saints. There's a nice section in the Confession on Communion of Saints. Uh, this is very agreeable to Calvin. We're obliged to the performance of such duties, public and private, as do conduce to their mutual good, both in inward and outward man. That is, if you're a Christian, you have a duty to other Christians. You're not free from obligation to seek unity, to seek peace, to seek the well-being of your brother and sister in Christ, even though they're a different denomination. And this is kind of surprising from the Westminster Confession, from Calvin. They're not really strict. You know, in a way, you got to hand it to them. Calvin was more liberal than the American Puritan. When the Puritans came to Boston, if you were a, a Quaker, they put a hot tongue, a hot poker through your tongue. If you're a Baptist, they sent you off to Rhode Island, but they were not uh, tolerant. And if you're a witch, in 1692, you were you went to jail and maybe were executed. So American Protestantism had a very mean streak to it, but you don't see that exactly in Calvin. You see kind of a fresh air about him in that he's saying, no, you have an obligation to love anyone who claims to be Christian. You know, you don't have that freedom to, um, to seek the harm of someone who calls himself a believer. And so Calvin is really kind of, you know, Strangely liberal for someone who's what? Ecumenical. Ecumenical, yeah. For someone who's so accused of severity, actually, it's not there. When it comes right down to it, and you profess the name of Christ, then I have an, a duty to you. I have an obligation to seek your good. But he doesn't have any use for for fraud doesn't have any use for, well, the papacy. Um, there's a warning in the confession about don't think that you